Um, I think we're going to have a, a, quite, a quite full evening. Uh, first off, uh, the Historic Society has asked me to give a, a, a short report on the progress of the uh, size of George Flint House. And then uh, we are fortunate to, enough to have four of the uh, host family members here to tell us about growing up in the, uh, in the Putnam House. And uh, Lyman Fancy is going to uh, speak to us about something about his father, something about his father, and Alfred Eisenhower is going to speak. I don't know who else, but whoever would like is welcome. So this will be very informal, and uh, I'll, I already asked him. <laughs> but so anyhow, uh, I'm going to just also, uh, Roy Walters gave me some pictures today that, that of the, uh, we can pass this from table to table, just so you can look at, at the progress that's going on down here at the, uh, at the Sergeant Flint House. We've been working on it. And we've been working on it uh, since last fall, and actually it's going very well. Yeah, this, I need to do this also. And you can pass those around while I'm talking about Well, I know there are people here that can tell you more about the history of uh, Sergeant George Flint and the, and the uh, Flint House better than I, but I will try to uh, just briefly tell you about where this whole, where this whole thing started. The, uh, the Simon Flint House, as far as historians uh, know, at this, uh, I mean, uh, historians have determined, it was the first building in this, this patch, uh, and built in about uh, 1668. And it was uh, built by Sergeant George Flint, and he built it uh, to protect his family because uh, they, up in ha the Havel area, there were a lot of Indian raids at that time. And so people were, of course, concerned about the protecting their family. So uh, this, this house was uh, uh, called the Block House, which is uh, described as a two-story dwelling uh, with, oak, with uh, oak sheathing, uh, vertically applied to the side wall, about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half thick, to protect people from, from the Indian raids. The, uh, these pictures will pass around is what we what you will see that it was sort of following uh, this description. Uh, the front door would face south, the back wall would have a fireplace and a chimney, and so forth. So, the, the as best I can tell, this uh, the Historic Society knew this building was in the vicinity based on reading history. And they weren't looking for it in Pat Romeo and Mr. Parker and some of them were into the woods looking for it. And I think that, that they found the foundation, but I don't think they felt as though the house had probably deteriorated. Well, later on, I don't know just what it was, they determined that it was attached to the Gowing House, the Gowing Farmhouse. And so I don't know how long they knew that or if they were sure of it. Anyhow, in 1994, the Gowan uh, farmhouse burnt, and this was left standing. And you can see in the in the uh, brochure that I'm sending around, there's some pictures of that. So the historic society asked us, we the Minutemen, if we would dismantle the rest of it, and we did, and we stored it under the Putnam House barn. A lot of the timbers were very poor, anyhow, but. Because we stored it there for some time, obviously we lost some of the timbers. Uh, however, we decided, and they asked us if we would put it back together, so we decided last year to do that. So we saved three of the major timbers, the original timbers that are, were in that building. And we uh, then uh, got a uh, contact in some, uh, the person up in Walpole, New Hampshire. And uh, he made it a, he hired him to make a, uh, an old plane for us so that we could put this structure back together and incorporate these three original timbers. So we, uh, 
Ken Bob uh, Snyder, I don't know if he's here this evening or not, but he dug the foundation of the whole forest for the foundation. Uh, he said, well, why shouldn't I? I am a Flint. So anyway, he worked <laughs> diligently on that for us. And then we, we, um, we uh, hired a, a foundation you know, firm to put in the, uh, uh, the concrete. Then we put the frame on it, and then the Minutemen sided it, and we have shingled it. Uh, and the shingling is three quarters complete now. Uh, and, and, in the, and you may notice this picture passing around. That's the, the chimney, the fireplace and chimney were installed this winter. And uh, I, the, the, when you see it, I think you'll be very pleased with it. It's the English brick is what you're going to see, the very narrow brick, uh, which came uh, from uh, House in Linfield. What's the name of the house, Pat? Uh, the uh, actually, I have it in my notes. <laughs> but uh, it's it's the the bricks uh, from this uh, this house was built in in, the, in 1700 and it was torn down last winter. And Mark Hall has all the bricks of which he gave us 2,000 of them uh, for this project. And I can't see, I can't tell what the name is. Nevertheless, uh, some of the bricks also in this chimney are from the Rattan factory in Wakefield. That was uh, built in uh, 1870. And some also were given to us by Joe Sadlow, which came from the Congregation Church. So we've got kind of a mixture of bricks in there. It's, it's very nice. Uh, the second floor is, is uh, closed in. Uh, and we just need to, as I say, finish the shingling, and then when we when we have enough money, we want to buy the oak for the outside. That oak will be inch and a quarter, white oak, and we're going to shiplap the seams, and uh, that will, except for the problem of the windows, we haven't decided uh, on what we want for windows. We you'll notice in my little book up there what. The 1600 windows are supposed to look like, but we're not sure quite yet uh, what we're going to do about that. But other than that, uh, we hope to have it ready for the Apple Festival for people to win it and they see it. So we've, uh, we've raised a little over $30,000 and it paid all of our bills thus far. So if we could uh, I think if we could get in the vicinity of another 10,000, we would have it completed. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that all the time. That's good. So uh, anyway, that's the report on the uh, Daniel Fuller House. Does anybody have any questions? Or? I just wanted to say, if somebody wants to send a check, send it to box 354. <laughs> 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 that a girl. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I understand. <laughs> Well, we're fortunate to have the, the speakers that I mentioned earlier. And uh, the first one I'd like to ask to come forward is uh, Eva Post. Uh, and she's going to tell us, uh, I think she's going to tell, she's going to tell us about the house. Thank you. tell my story because it's mainly about my mother. She was the most wonderful woman you ever met. And our story really began in Charlestown. We had a little house in Charlestown and my father got sick. And when he got sick, he had tuberculosis and he died very young. And my baby, we all checked out fine except the baby. And the baby was only five years old. And she was sent to North Reading to the sand. In those days, North Reading was like another world. <laughs> and luckily, my grandfather worked with Pat. And when he told Pat the story about my mother, and my mother never drove or anything like that, he said, I have a big empty house in North Reading, and she's welcome to come there. So we went to North Reading, and my mother, the first thing my mother did when she sold the house in Charlestown, she bought a hot water heater. Because the house was cold. We never had any heat in the house. And um, I guess Pat was very, very good to us. He slept in the little bedroom in the back of the house. Yeah. And I don't know how we, I don't know how we slept there because it, you know, 
<laughs> it was, you know, it was a small room when you see it. And then the girls, uh, we mainly lived really in the kitchen and in the dining room. And above the dining room were the girls' room. And all the girls had a bed in there, and we had these little beds that were wooden. I think they were army plots, but my mother they painted were. them a different color. We they all were. had our names on the bed. <laughs> and the boys had the room over the, uh, the, living, the living room. And my mother had the room as you went up the stairs, which really had no privacy. You had to cut through the rooms. And then there was a little room upstairs. My sister Betty had that room. I don't know how she got a room all by herself that she had that room. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we all moved. There was eight of us. And of course, my brother, did, my oldest brother, really didn't spend any time. He was a city kid. He didn't really like North Reading. And he would always be down with my aunt. And my aunt would say, you have to go home. He would say, I am home. And Betty didn't spend too much time there, but actually the rest of us did. And Pat was wonderful to us. I mean, he never scolded us, he never yelled at us, and he was very, very good to us. And when my mother bought, uh, my mother then bought a cow because we had so many kids. And then Pat taught the boys how to milk the cow and how to make butter. Uh, and then the next thing we, did, we had, well, we had a horse, but Jerry the horse was very, very elderly, and he was always falling over and breaking the pond apart. So, so my mother finally got a tractor. And that's when it all started. And Pat really taught the, us what to do. We planted the meadow with just potatoes. And believe it or not, the potatoes almost lasted all winter because it was a dirt floor, and I didn't even know this. We spread the potatoes on the floor, so every time we needed potatoes, we'd go downstairs. And then we had pigs. We had two pigs every year. And of course, my brothers, who always thought they were funny, named the pigs after us girls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, would, they had somebody come, and they would butcher the pigs right on the property. And I mean, we must have been cruel kids, because I remember when we knew the guys were coming, we would sit there and watch. <laughs> and uh, then they would go to Georgetown. They would take the pigs to Georgetown. They would cut them like ham, whatever you wanted, bacon. They would just make all the, the different things. And some of them hung in the cellar. And then when you needed any kind of uh, meat or anything, we just took the car to Georgetown. We'd go, they would get the locker in there. Now, my mother, you know, this was her five-year-old baby that was here. And thank God, at that time, North Reading had a bus that really left from the center of town. So my mother would take the bus down to Kitty's, and then she'd walk up to the sand to spend time with the, with the baby. Of course, luckily, uh, Mary Lou was never a bed patient. In fact, she likes to kid around and say, I got all you people to go to North Reading. Because <laughs> if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be in North Reading. And um, like I said, it was just that, I remember when I got married, and I went to Sturbridge Village, and I was like amazed because that's how we were living, and it was all because of Pat. Because he just did things like he was told to do, so it was passed down from generation to generation, and um, and that's how we lived. My and Pat spent a lot of time, especially with my brother Billy. He's not here tonight. Billy's in Texas visiting his daughter. Uh, he um, they they chop wood together. And my brother Billy said it was the first time he ever had a brand new bike. Pat bought him a brand new bike. Mm -hmm. And it just was, I think, amazing that this house, as old as it is, only had two different families live there, the Putnams mm -hmm. and us. And I'm very friendly with the Putnams. In fact, I talked to Dolores this morning, and they live in Maine. And she was like a sister to us because, well, the funny thing, I should go back in time. I one time asked Pat, I said, Pat, did you ever get married? And he said, yes, and I have two children. And I thought this was strange. And I said, you have two children, where are they? He said, I don't know. He said, and I said, well, aren't you going to go look for them? He said, they'll come back.